I'm Jess Griggs, the host of Night Music at KMFA 89.5, and I'm here today at Red House Music Studio in Eastish Austin to discuss the uh, new music contemporary art scene in Austin and his newest project, Insectum. And I'm here with composer, uh, improviser, band leader, Austin's beloved ruiner of the holidays. And I say this with the utmost respect, <laughs> Austin elder statesman of the <laughs> music scene and art scene, Graham Reynolds. Thank Hello. you so much for having us here today. Thanks for having me or thanks for coming yeah. by. Yeah. So before we really start about Insectum, um, I'd love to talk a little bit about just kind of like the Austin art scene in general, if you're yeah. chill with that. Cool. Um, so I saw in like, I think it's a 2021 KUT, KUTX interview, you started creating music in Austin in 1993, is that yeah. right? Something like that in the 90s? Yeah. They're thus the elder. Thus the elder. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything that you find that you're kind of nostalgic for or miss in the art scene or arts community from that time? Yes, I'm not one, although plenty of uh, people close to me are like, oh, it's ruined kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I don't feel that way, but I do feel it's you know, radically transformed in ways that there are things lost that will will never get back. I think uh, the biggest thing that has shrunk dramatically was uh, the the theater scene. Oh, really? So that grew uh, and grew and grew and peaked in the late '90s, early aughts. Okay. Um, and it require you know exper a, a robust theater scene requires both an audience and affordable large space and affordable uh, living because you have to work for months or years on a piece that pays very little. Yeah. Uh, and so it's not something that does well in uh, an expensive environment. And in a place like New York, mm -hmm. you just go further and further out and the subway st still works mm -hmm. and our, our mass transit is not it's not in that kind of shape, no. so it's very difficult to sustain. And so, uh, we used to have so many more small theater companies doing work, and uh, and and that's just shrunk dramatically. Whereas other things have uh, grown. You know, I think mm -hmm. the the new music scene, the the new sort of classical music scene, has uh, grown pretty dramatically at the yeah. same time. Um, so. You know, I, I wouldn't say I'd trade one for the other, but it's, yeah. you can definitely see things emerge and things disappear. I heard this rumor out on the street that like <laughs> when you first moved here, you went to like a concert or something every night of the week. Is that <laughs> true? Uh, well, we used to go uh, pretty much every night to emos because oh, okay. we had no money. Like, yeah. uh, I was cleaning houses and making $600 a month, so like there was no money to do yeah. anything. I feel like uh, that should just go to show how much Austin's changed yeah, rent-wise. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You can imagine. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. Uh, and Emo's at the time was downtown, and it was free. The shows were free. And so, uh, you know, we were able to go out every night, see music, and yeah. see friends, and, and all that, w without spending anything yeah. if we didn't want. Um, but then there was one, like, when I was putting out a, a first album and really was trying to take a turn um, career-wise, I decided, okay, I'm going to go out literally every night for a year to something. Which is, like, yeah. kind of impressive. <laughs> I, yeah. you know, uh, even though, uh, you know, I know a lot of people now, yeah. um, I'm not... I'm not the most introverted person, but I'm certainly not the most extroverted person. Yeah, yeah. It was very easy for me to go out to emos and not talk to anybody except for my roommate or something totally. like that. Totally, yeah. And um, so part of my thought was if I'm going to actually build uh, something, mm -hmm. I need to know a lot more people. Yeah. And so, yeah, just leading up to releasing an album and trying to take a step up. Mm -hmm. I decided to go out every night for a year and sometimes it would be, a lot of times it would be emos or, you know, electric lounge or these punk rock, indie rock venues, but then it might be classical or jazz. And yeah. I tried to go where I would know at least some one person in the room mm -hmm. and then hang around until I got introduced to more people. And so by the end of the year, I had a much larger network 
than I started with. And I, I still go out a lot, but certainly not every night. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine how that's draining. Um, yeah, do you have like a most memorable time out of that year? Like a just a concert or something that like really sticks out to you? Going to see country music was probably the thing that was outside of me mm -hmm. that was uh, the most compelling to me because I'd grown up in the Northeast. Okay. And uh, country music was very much other. I mean, I listened to more gamelan music than I listened to country music growing up. So it was like such another world and uh, the craftspersonship in country music here was so mm -hmm. high. Yeah. Um, and it continues to be one of the only rooms I consistently find where people from uh, the left and the right find themselves in the same room, mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. people who are wealthy and people who are not find themselves in the same yeah, room. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and so it's this place where people can cross over in a way that, you know, you did not find that in a punk rock room or something no. like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and at least not as consistently. Mm -hmm. And... So that was exciting and educational and just fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the uh, then at the end, I also had a CD release show, and I had a lot more people that I could invite. And invite, yeah. so we were able to have a great show, and you know, I tried to get as many people as I could, mm -hmm. and it, it was packed, and we had a good time. And yeah. you know, those things. Um, uh, lead to more things you know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. kind of snowballs and yeah, all that stuff. yeah yeah exactly so yeah. so it was an educational year and a fun year and then it also had the sort of professional results that i was hoping for. for yeah what um i love that you bring up the the country scene like being being from the south i feel like the blue scene is very much like that like you see a lot of folks coming in the room and uh generally not part of the same walks of life right. but I lived up in the Northeast as well for a little bit but I came back down to the south in Austin just because right. I like really missed that what a what keeps you here what keeps you in Austin is, is like is there anything in the community right now that you are excited about or there are a lot of things that yeah. keep me here as far like what drew me here was one to try something different I mm. grew up in the Northeast playing gigs in New York and and things like that and uh, you know, I consider the West Coast as well, mm -hmm. but it, it was different, but not as different mm -hmm. as coming to Austin. The other thing is I had piano and I had drums, and these are big, loud things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you can't really do that in an apartment. You have to <laughs> rent a rehearsal space yeah, or, yeah. or uh, whatever it might be. And uh, I'm not disciplined enough to, okay, I've got to practice, you know, drums this morning, so I'm going to get up, get on the subway, travel mm -hmm. 45 minutes, set up my drums in the practice room that I have to share with others because I can only afford to share and then practice and then break them down and get back on the subway and then somehow get to work and pay my bills and, and do I yeah. just I know I'm, obviously New York musicians do it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I it, it felt to me like all those hours on the subway could be you know, I could walk across the room and play my instrument instead of, mm -hmm. you know, travel across the city. Yeah, yeah. And in Austin, you could rent a house really cheaply. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to, with a couple college friends, rent a house and have a rehearsal space and, and have all my gear set up and be as loud. And, uh, and, and so that's what, that was the initial thing that drew me. Um, and then it's treated me well. I feel like, you know, we're, we're halfway between uh, New York and Mexico City and mm -hmm. L.A. Yeah. And I do work in all those places. And, uh, and I kind of love being in the middle of, uh, of all that. And I think it's still a small enough city where the scenes really overlap in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, and... And then just my network here is built here, even though I have networks elsewhere, mm -hmm. but, you know, I have this nice studio that I, you know, it's yeah. bigger than anything I could afford in L.A. or New York, mm -hmm. and I have thicker walls here so I can be even louder. <laughs> yeah, and it's, like, really turned into, I feel like, a gathering place for the community with, like, the young composers, and, like, I know, you know, a bunch of my friends have worked <laughs> here, like, I, it's... I try to yeah. make it a 
welcoming place where you want to make music. Yeah. Yeah, kind of talking about the scene. Are there any like local bands or artists that you think should be on everybody's radar right now? Well, actually, so first I'll just start with like the new music, new, new classical mm -hmm. scene. Because that, that's one of the things that's, it was always easy to go see great country music. Yeah. It yeah. was always easy to go see certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, the indie rock. You know, sure. Uh, yeah. And punk rock and things like that. Um, but there weren't a whole lot of composers and there weren't a whole lot of mm -hmm. ensembles doing new composed music. And for visual art, m more often than not, we would go to Houston and go to the Manila or something like Got that. It. Yeah. And a lot of these things have grown up. And, and mm -hmm. uh, so now. Here Be Monsters was a good example. This is a mini festival, mm -hmm. one day festival that Tetractus put together last year. It was a whole day full of new composed music. Yeah. Two stages. Uh, I mean, I don't remember if it was noon to midnight, but it was something like that. Mm -hmm. It was like it was so much day. new yeah. music. Um, and, you know, uh, all the ensembles were from here in Austin. Mm -hmm. And m many of you, if of the composer, not all, but most of the composers were from here in Austin. So it's just a radical transformation yeah. from what it was 20, 30 years ago. And so that's super exciting. It's easy to go out and be inspired and stimulated by th that kind of music. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to still the still great country music and, and all yeah, the other yeah. things that have that have been here all along. So that that's uh, that's probably the thing I'm most excited about that transformation mm -hmm. in in the scene, and uh, so it continues to feed me as an artist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you like? At least for me, I I feel like that Austin kind of new music, contemporary music scene. Like I really hesitate to classify it even as like classical. I see a lot of that country and indie kind of crossing in and crossing over into it. Do you do you feel like Austin kind of has a unique contemporary music sound in that way, or is yeah. this, this? I mean, the whole time, like when Peter Stubchinsky and I started Golden Hornet. Like putting a label on it was very difficult and you know mm -hmm. everybody resists labels totally. they're so confining but at the same time so useful i mean duke ellington didn't consider what he did jazz he didn't mm -hmm. like the word jazz uh and there were a lot of reasons for that one it boxed him in yeah uh, but also jazz like he wanted he felt like that um it wasn't just musically that it put him in a box. It mm -hmm. put a ceiling on how much respect he could get. It, yeah. uh, it did, did a whole lot of things. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, swing and uh, jazz chord progressions and jazz improvisation, there's, there's a lot to jazz that the word does convey and mm -hmm. it's, it's a useful word at the same time. Yeah. Um, this new composed music scene is, is never f quite figured out and it's never been mainstream enough maybe either mm -hmm. for like a, a handle to catch on in, in, in the me media. Yeah. And so like new music is such a, um, it's, it's an overconfident word that, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, that yeah. just says, that, that, you know, it's from mid-century or something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. They said like, there was, there's new country music, there's new metal, there's new yeah. uh, all sorts of stuff yeah. that's all new, uh, you know, and if, you know, Beyonce puts out a new album, she's always pushing her own envelope, mm -hmm. that is new music, and so calling yourself new music is pretty, pretty rough. Uh, so I, in, in a way, uh, you know, and then they tried indie classical, um, mm -hmm. and, but none of it's really caught on. I think I, I say new cl cl new classical, even though that seems like a contradiction. More often yeah. than that, it's pretty simple. If I played with horns, especially saxophone, mm -hmm. people would say, "Oh, he's, he does jazz." If I played with violin or cello, people would say, mm -hmm. "Oh, he does classical." I could play the exact same notes, and mm -hmm. people would say that didn't yeah. have to swing, and, or it didn't have to be fully notated. Mm -hmm these other things that correlate strongly with the, the, those labels. And, and so you go to 
like here be monsters. There are a lot of strings. There are a lot of people who write down notes that other people mm -hmm. play. These things that correlate with classical music, even if it's not the same thing as Beethoven or anything like that, and of course it's got its own limitations, but mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it's, I've, I've struggled to find other words that say as much to a person who's not from the insider audience. Sure, if you yeah. say, yeah, I do this classical thing, they'll picture an orchestra or mm -hmm. strings, and that'll be semi-correct. That's actually a good transition point. Yeah. I'd love to talk a little bit um, about Insectum, which is yeah. one of the newest projects to come out of Golden Hornet. Um, and it's described on the website as a sonic exploration of the world of anthropods. Um, and before we get into that kind of sonic and musical element, I'd really like to talk about the subject matter of the album specifically. Yeah. But it seems like, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, kind of the umbrella of the album is this collapsing ecosystem of insects and kind of climate change. And I know that that's something that's on my mind a lot is kind of global warming, climate change. Mm -hmm. But in that conversation, insects are not like the sexiest thing. It's right. not really at the forefront yeah, yeah. of the conversation. So what um, what was the inspiration to, to really center this album on on that ecosystem? It was Maria Sibyl and Marion was, okay. the, was the initial impulse. We had done Sound of Science, mm -hmm. uh, and that was with Jeffrey Ziegler and Golden Hornet and a whole bunch of composers we commissioned. And I was looking for a non-male scientist that was yeah. doing something really interesting. And I found this amazing person who yeah. did, did this uh, influential but also hidden a little bit from, mm -hmm. from some of the science histories um, work and started diving into that. And then that led me to being interested in insects more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, and Jeffrey and I had been searching for another project to do, so we connected over that. And then we asked Susie in, and Susie does a lot of uh, work uh, about the environment. Mm, she's, yeah. she's always concerned that we don't focus, that we balance it, that even though there's a lot of gloom and doom, mm -hmm. that, it, mm -hmm. that there's also some celebration yeah. in there as well. Um, but yeah, when we used to tour, it was, there's, so, there's so much anecdotal evidence about mm -hmm. that collapse. We used to tour and you know, you drive a few hours and your windshield would need to be clean because it's yeah. covered with bugs. And now you drive, and there's nothing on the windshield. Mm -hmm. It's just like the, the number of insects has collapsed and unlike humans, insects are actually essential for the global ecosystem to function. Mm -hmm. You take away humans, virtually every other life form it's a, like thrives Yeah, and is better off. You take away insects, everything collapses. So the, these essential, if not beloved creatures and there's tens of millions and many of them still unidentified. Mm -hmm. uh, so just an sort of infinite world to explore. And then I started uh, editing, uh, auditing uh, Alex Wilde's entomology class at UT. Okay, yeah. And then uh, met his uh, wife and fellow entomologist, uh, Joanne Holly. And they came in the project and would give us feedback as we develop things and say, no, that doesn't sound like army ants. Army ants do this, not that. And okay. then, uh, some very concrete feedback that guided the direction of some of the tracks and then helped with the titling at the end uh, with some that were exploring insect sounds for us, but then they put more specific names on them and things like that. So we had, you know, when I decided to do music, it was, uh, you know, you had to get rid of all the other things that were mm -hmm. interesting about life. And I like learning, and so getting to dive into this other field is always exciting, and I look for opportunities to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's really interesting. Like when you had uh, the UT professor entomologist come in, what did that collaboration look like? Like how how did they tell you, oh, hey, army ants right. sound like this uh, earthworm or right. whatever. A snail eating an earthworm yeah. sounds like X, you know? So that was, um, the, pro the whole project started uh, collaboratively during mm -hmm. pandemic. Okay. And so we were doing a lot of 
recording, sending ideas to each other, and then layering and, and things like that. So what we did was give them a whole big folder of sketches, ideas, musical mm -hmm. uh, mini compositions, and asked for their feedback. Yeah, yeah. Um, and some of them had titles that were like, you know, army ants, and others had titles like Susie, Loop One, or you know, they didn't, yeah, yeah. they sounded like insects to us, but they weren't specific in any way. Mm. Um, so we just went track to track and got their, they listened before the meeting, but then we had a big Zoom and went track by track and got their feedback on each of them. Okay. And army ants sounds very regimented. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so we had a very regimented piece. And they explained that army ants attack in a chaotic swarm. Okay. And then retreat yeah. in, a, in lines that are very regimented. Mm -hmm. So we added an extended introduction that was a swarm of Susie's amazing drumming. Uh, and then went on to the more regimented piece as the second half. Okay. Um, so from... From that as well, with uh, so you're collaborating. Sorry, just for for the folks listening, uh, with Susie Ibarra, which mm -hmm. is a per former percussionist composer, and Jeffrey Ziegler, uh, composer, cellist, performer as mm -hmm. well. Um, was that kind of an organic collaborative project from the beginning? Did you choose the the umbrella idea of the ecosystem, or like kind of back and forth? We started. Um, we started with the concept of yeah world of insects okay so, yeah yeah um and then eva each of us in our own workspaces created ideas sent them to each other okay. and just kept layering going back and forth and then eventually once things let up uh and travel was possible again we got together for a day at national sawdust in brooklyn yeah. to do sort of finishing touches and some some layers that were impossible to do like when we're thousands of miles away from each other and so layer those in with the pandemic recordings and, and then finish the album that way i want to go back to maria real mm -hmm. quick if that's yeah. cool yeah because i'm 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 really on like i yeah. said that 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 rabbit hole so how did i know you said you were looking for a female scientist uh, entomologist how how did you find her work initially um do you just kind of stumble on a book or did somebody recommend her work I think it was as simple as a bunch of Google Googles. searching at first, yeah. and then she seemed like an interesting figure, and because she was a painter and an artist, mm -hmm. uh, in addition to a scientist, yeah. there was cool stuff to see immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then, which led me to read a biography of her, okay. and then order some of the big, huge, beautiful art books that yeah. she'd done as well. And her illustrations are gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. Well, and... Uh, what was happening at the time, uh, and this is very gendered, but this, mm -hmm. like, uh, the male scientists, yep. again, generally speaking, totally. yep. were very into cataloging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you find an insect, you put it literally in a cubicle kind of thing, and then you yeah. find this, and you put it in a cubicle, and then you do this. And everything was separated into little tiny boxes. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. little like displays with these little tiny boxes yeah. were very popular at the time uh, like the wealthy would have little curio displays and scientists would have these things and books would have everything siloed mm -hmm. and what she did was that each or almost every one of her paintings or or drawings were ecosystems yeah. so they would have the plant and uh, the various insects and birds or whatever it might be, but mm -hmm. especially the plants and the insects that were codependent and existed together all in one image. Yeah. And so the, that they were integrated um, was far ahead of the thinking of the other scientists yeah. at the time. Yeah. And I, I think I read, she was like one of the first people to document the life cycle. Yeah, of, exactly. of insects because of that thinking as opposed to that cataloging. Yeah. She was especially, yeah. like, she studied lots of insects, but she was studying butterflies in particular mm -hmm. in that whole cycle mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what made it work and how it worked and, and yeah. documenting each part each, of it. Yeah. Um, you know, she, she did get through a lot of barriers to get to the point where she uh, could do that work as totally. you might imagine yeah 
uh, and the stories are amazing with how, how she did that. It's interesting, like going back to the album a little bit, you know, you're saying that she documented um, butterflies and that kind of metamorphosis. Um, a lot of the insects on the, the album are not what's going to kind of like the sexier ones. They're not the pollinators right, that right. we're talking about. They're not the bees and the dragonflies. And was there, was that kind of a conscious choice? to do snails and I guess yeah. what we would traditionally think of pollinators and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. we we did have uh, uh, like, you know, Golden Hornet who commissioned this as a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. you know, when we said, oh, we're doing insects, there was there were some donors like, I don't like insects. Yeah. And, and so yeah. <laughs> it was slightly harder to fundraise for at first. Uh, and, you know, if we'd done, said we're doing a butterfly project, it would have been easier to fundraise mm -hmm, for, mm -hmm. and uh, dragonflies are super cool because they're ancient. They're like the they're like the biplanes. They're the super old fashioned design of wings yeah, yeah. that you know uh, one of the earliest flying insects. But um, Susie, Jeffrey, and I we didn't really talk about a strategy. We didn't say, "Oh, let's not do the pretty ones." Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, but I think we all gravitated uh, slightly away from that, maybe because it was just. The most obvious thing would be butterflies. The beauty of butterflies and beauty of dragonflies is interesting unto itself. Mm -hmm. um, but getting somewhere like beneath that, the sort of well-trod yeah. aesthetic surface um, to what's interesting about the broader mm -hmm. body of insects. You guys will be premiering this work on yeah. February 22nd at the Draylon Mason Music Studio at KMFA. What can um, the audience expect in terms of the soundscape and in terms of, of that concert? So we're all going to find out together a little bit. Okay. Because all three of us are improvisers as well as composers mm -hmm. on the album. And right now the set list is in, in C, the, the album sequence. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like... The, the tune Army Ants that we did. When we did it pandemic-wise and did it in our studios, it was three minutes long. When we did it together, live and improvising in New York, it was 12 minutes long. And so there's no way we could do that and do the whole all nine tracks. It would be far too long of a concert. Uh, and so we're making charts and we're prepping and then we're gonna have several rehearsals here in the studio. Uh, when they get to Austin and I think we'll work through what's gonna make it what's gonna not maybe everything will appear in little bits and others will be extended but it'll be a combination of the sounds from the album with everybody's improvisation and, and continuing to go off the themes and sounds that we use for the album. Awesome and is there anything else you want to add before we wrap That's up? That's it I just I love the what KMFA is done with that building, and the, the Draylon Mason is a great room, so I'm excited for the concert. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's all our production team doing good work. So, awesome. yeah. But well, thank cool. you so much for your time today. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.